tonight we're going to go through basically section seven of the POH. Um, we only have time for kind of a brief overview, um, but it at least will cover most of it. So uh, first, first question: Why, why learn about aircraft systems? Anybody helps you think about things when they go stuff goes wrong. Yep, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay, we'll throw up tonight to become a safer pilot. That's a good one. Troubleshoot issues on the ground and in the air. That's a good one, right? So the more you know, uh, the more you can possibly save your your butt uh, or not fly an aircraft that's um, not airworthy, for example. Uh, also know the difference between a cosmetic issue and and something that that really you don't want to fly it with. Uh, this comes becomes an issue when you're out in the field. Let's say you land at an airport in the middle of nowhere and get ready to get come fly back to the base, and uh, you know some issue. You could possibly you know I don't want to say you would fix it because in the CAP we're not allowed to touch the aircraft, but you'll at least know whether it's something you could fly with or you need to walk home. Um, you'll also have a better understanding of what systems are required for what operations. So, you know, something might break that's only required for RFR flight, um, but you're, you know, getting ready to fly back to base in pure VFR conditions. So perhaps you're good to go. Um, another thing that, you know, the more you know about the systems, the more you'll be able to notice things and um, you know, be aware of sounds and smells that, you know, indicate an issue. So tonight we're going to cover basically, as I said, section seven from the airframe, which is a little strange to be in the systems, but it's, I guess, the main system. Without the airframe, we don't have any other systems. Uh, we'll go on to flight controls, the instrument panel, wings, uh, wing flaps, and uh, we'll talk about the engine, propeller, fuel system, brakes, cabin heating, the pedostatic system, the vacuum system, stall warning system, and um, Marty's going to cover the electrical system and the avionics. And so if you did your homework and read section seven, this will basically be a, a review for you. So let's get started with the airframe. It's an all metal four place high wing single engine airplane equipped with tricycle landing gear. That's right out of the POH. Um, so what do we want to know about? the um, the airframe mainly we're concerned is it structurally sound right I mean is the airframe itself doesn't really have any moving parts you know unless you can consider the controls control services um, so we want to make sure that it's structurally sound you want to keep an eye out for corrosion bubbles up underneath paint looks like little bubbles like that. Um, more subtle things that you can't, you may not be able to detect on a pre-flight, but if you look underneath, dig your head way underneath and look up, you can possibly see the results of a, a hard landing on the nose gear where the uh, firewall has been all wrinkled. You definitely want to ground the plane if you see something like that. Um, this is this this wingtip is I've never seen so many uh, stop cracks stop drilled. Uh, the wingtip is basically a piece of plastic, and I'm sure the plane plane will fly just fine without it. But I definitely wouldn't recommend flying an aircraft that had this many cracks in that in that wingtip. Um, and it's kind of funny because uh, you know an AMP has clearly stop drilled it and allowed it to continue to fly, which is strange because even a part like that could fall off and you know hit someone on the ground, so that's that's not very cool. Next on the list here is flight controls. In this aircraft, all the, all the control services are connected via cables and pulleys. Um, you want to make sure these are operating smoothly and correctly. I once had a, a flight instructor tell me he took off on a DC-3 and he went to turn left and the plane turned right. Uh, apparently had been rigged incorrectly. Um, so you definitely want to move the controls, the yoke forward, back, left and right, and confirm that the control surfaces are moving in the right direction. Um, 
another thing that comes from the glider world is the um, the positive control check. You know, we don't typically do that in the power planes, but you know, there's no reason you shouldn't. Um, you don't have to do it every time, but at least sometimes. Uh, the reason it it's done on gliders is because um, they take the gliders uh, apart a lot and put them back together, um, even you know minutes before they fly them. So it's very important to make sure all the cables are connected and stuff. Cables don't typically get get disconnected in a in a power plane, but anytime after maintenance, you know, a positive control check is is good to do. And this is basically requires two people, somebody to move the yoke inside while someone holds the controls on the outside. And so you make sure um, that the control isn't just you know moving by gravity or whatever. Any questions about that? Nope. OK, great. So we'll just move on. Uh, the instrument panel. For those of you who hadn't seen the G1000, you've got the primary flight display on the left, audio panel in the middle, and the multifunction display on the right. Standby instruments down below, the traditional um, analog, if you will. Uh, switches, and breakers down here underneath the yoke. Actually, let me uh, just do this here. Switch. <coughs> Switches over here, circuit breakers all down here, and uh, obviously engine controls here. One of the things that you want to note on the cat plane is we have an extra audio panel here. You won't find that on the production version. That's something that cap has added. Afterwards, we have the Becker here for direction finding of ELTs, and we have the cap radio here. These little red button here is the reversionary button. So if you lose this screen here, you can push this button and all that information will come over here. And this is an important button here in the upper right corner of the, the, the right. This little red switch in the upper right corner is the um, remote switch for the ELT. Uh, so in the event of an off airport landing that hasn't triggered, you can go ahead and turn that on. Wing flaps, they're uh, controlled by this, this lever in the cockpit, of course. Uh, they have these little detents here for different um, degrees of flaps. And they also note the, the different air speeds that you can use them. Uh, the important thing to know is that there's one flap motor. So you don't have a flap motor in each wing. You just have one in the right wing and it's uh, connected via cables to the other one. So it's conceivable that you could have a, an asymmetric flap situation. That would be very bad. Um, so it's a good idea to check your flaps on the ground. Make sure they're both coming down evenly. Uh, while in the air and, and before you take off, if you're taking off with flaps, you make sure they're, they are deployed evenly and they're deployed to the setting that you wanted them. Uh, they are electric in this aircraft, so be aware of that when you lose your electrical system. That um, you may not have flaps and so you would want to look for a longer runway, that sort of stuff. If your flaps aren't working, you know, check your circuit breaker. Any questions about flaps? OK. Engine. So we have a horizontally opposed six cylinder. Overhead valve air cooled fuel injected engine with a wet sump lubrication system. We'll go in a little bit more detail of the lubrication system in a few slides. Specifically um, manufactured by the Lycoming Ly company and uh, typically known as the IO 540. 230 horsepower. Uh, some of the things to be concerned with 
is these baffles right here. These engine baffles are actually really important for cooling. Air comes into the uh, the air inlets behind the propeller here, flows over the top of the engine, and is forced down through the cylinder fins and and down and out the cow flaps at the bottom. So if these baffles aren't sealing properly against the cowling, the air will just flow across the top and not down through the cylinders and provide the, the necessary cooling. Um, as you know, you can open and close the cow flaps to control that airflow a little bit. So if you close the cow flaps, the, the air doesn't really, it still comes in and gets forced down through here, but it doesn't really have anywhere to go. So it kind of provides a little bit of a back pressure and keeps things warmer. Um, and that's what you want to do, obviously, for um, cruising and descending. But for uh, taxi and climbing, you want to have those cow flaps open. Obviously, you want to make sure there's no cow plugs in here when you're pre-flighting the plane, because you do want that air to flow in there. Uh, as much as you can see when the cowling's on, you want to check the conditions of the hoses, stuff like that. Um, one important thing in the POH is um, you can't operate this aircraft if your, your um, cylinder head temperature probe number three is inoperative. So this means, you know, you've got six, six cylinder head temperature probes. Five of them are working. Number three is not. They, they uh, consider that the critical cylinder. Uh, the one that runs the hottest apparently and so you're not supposed to fly without that uh, the maximum cylinder head temperature is 500 degrees in this aircraft i wouldn't recommend it cap doesn't recommend above 400 so you know be sure to lean your mixture um, so that it doesn't <coughs> go much above 400. Any questions about CHTs and the engine? Two two questions. You said something like it's obvious that during cruise or whatever, you might like to have the flap the have it run hotter. I ask why is that obvious? And two, you <laughs> said leading the mixture, which um, at least in some engines will make it run hotter rather than colder. So I'm wondering why you said that. Yeah, that's good. Both good questions. So when you're in cruise, you have you have a lot of airflow. And the engine is working not as hard as it is when in climbing, um, and so you can end up creating a, a big difference between the warmth of the fire inside of the cylinders and the coldness. You know, especially at altitude, right? It's got very cold air, um, and so when the outside of the cylinder is cold, it's smaller, and then you've got a fire inside the cylinder, and it's trying to get bigger, right? So you can end up, um, you know, having your pistons and rings really pushing against the inside of that cylinder wall. And so you want to let your cylinders be warm. You don't want to like super cool them, right? Um, and so that's that's maybe it's not obvious, right? That's why we're here tonight, right? Um, <clears throat> so you know, obviously, obviously, and I'll try not to use that word. Um, the checklist has you close the cow flaps in cruise and descent, um, and those those are some of the reasons, right? Um, and then I said lean, and I, and I meant the leaning procedure, not necessarily lean it more. It's just, you know, as you lean your engine, stop at a point where, um, you know, and typically you lean with, with um, your exhaust temperatures, but at some point, you know, a few minutes later, you will notice that your um, cylinder head temperatures will be climbing as well. Um, and so during the leaning procedure is what I meant, not necessarily lean it, as as hot as you can make it, <laughs> right? Because the the uh, reduced, uh, <clears throat> or I guess the, the the lesser fuel to air ratio will increase the temperature, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, there's all kind of graphs that you can look up on on the web about, you know, where the exact you know, lean of peak, rich of peak, all of this stuff. Um, 
so there actually is a point where it'll get cooler again when it actually stops running because there's no fuel, no no yes. combustion. <laughs> gets really cool. That's one edge of the graph, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and also a reminder, at least for the G1000s with like Comet, uh, operation at lean of peak is prohibited. Mm -hmm. It's in the POH, so remember that. I know some people get really passionate about lean of peak or rich of peak, but it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's prohibited in the POH. Also, remember it's a 182, no abrupt throttle changes. Don't go from 23 inches climb power to idle. Right, shock cooling. Shock cooling. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Um, so, you know, it's a it's a four-stroke combustion engine, uh, and if you're not familiar with this term, it comes from um, four four strokes of the uh, the piston up and down the uh, the cylinder here, and so air is so basically the engine is a is an air pump it's a glorified air pump it sucks in air from the outside through the intake um, and comes into the intake manifold here on so fuel the as the cylinder moves down fuel and air is drawn in through the intake not quite who said that it's Kevin. The fuel is through the center. That's the fuel injector. <laughs> no. um, the, in this picture, sure, sure. Um, but if you read the POH on this particular aircraft, this 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 picture didn't come from that aircraft. The um, the uh, fuel injector is actually in in the intakes intake so right a, before the uh, the intake valve. It's a so throttle body injector then. It's According to the POH, it's right, it, it's on the cylinder, and obviously each cylinder is separate. Uh, and it's on the cylinder right before the intake valve. And so the fuel atomizes with the air just right before it enters uh, the combustion chamber, right? Um, so the intake draws that in, and then you have the compression stroke where it's compressed, that the piston is moving up and compresses the, the mixture. And right somewhere where just before it gets to the top, the um, spark will ignite that and make a fire, an explosion. And that's called the power stroke as it pushes the piston back down. And then finally, the piston comes up and the exhaust valve opens and expels the spent gases. And in a six cylinder, so you have six of these pistons moving at slightly different times and all doing this this four stroke cycle here. Any questions about that? Nope. Okay, great. Uh, the G1000 engine instruments, there's a whole bunch of modules, and um, Marty will go into this in more detail in his slides, that comprise the G1000 system. And, and one of the modules, one of the units, is the, um, is the engine indicating system here. And there's a bunch of sensors all around the engine that feed data to this unit and then that data is then displayed on one of your displays either your pfd if if you want and usually on the mfd so just like your analog instruments you know you'll, you'll have manifold pressure a tachometer a fuel flow oil pressure oil temperature cylinder head temperature and the exhaust gas temperature uh, lots of room for failures here. The display being the big one, you lose everything uh, if you lose a display. Um, but you could lose a sensor, one of these sensors, 
fuel flow sensor tachometer and so you'll get a red x when that happens and I, and I think marty will show you some of that a little later on uh the lubrication system as we mentioned was a wet sump type uh which means that basically it has an oil pan if you will where a puddle of oil sits and it's pumped uh, throughout the engine The POH talks about different um, weights of fuel that you can use. CAP prefers to use this Phillips XC2050. Important numbers are the capacity. Uh, it's maximum capacity is nine quarts. Minimum is four. Uh, but Nine is actually too much, and, and, and these engines will just dump it out on the ground. So we kind of prefer to run eight quarts, uh, and that's also in the POH. Um, the only reason you'd fill it to nine quarts is for an extended flight. Um, and the reason that number exists is because the FAA wants to make sure that the engine will hold enough oil um, for the duration of the flight. Uh, and they also allow your engine to burn a, a quart or burn or use or otherwise throw out of the engine uh, up to one quart an hour. And so you wanna make sure that you have enough oil for your flight. If, if you know your engine uses one quart an hour, and you need to land with at least four quarts, otherwise you're gonna have some problems with your engine uh, and you're going for a three hour flight, then you know you, you need at least seven quarts, right? If you're going for a five hour flight, you're gonna have to fill it all the way to nine. Uh, most importantly, when you start the engine, monitor your oil pressure. So the normal range is 50 to 90. couple things that can happen to oil. It can be consumed by the engine uh, or burnt, burned. And that happens when there's leaks in the valve stems or, um, or the piston rings. Oil can escape from where it's supposed to be into the combustion chamber and actually get burnt and sent out the exhaust pipe. Uh, other, other more common ways of losing the oil is is um, overfilling. Obviously, it's just going to throw it out the breather tube, as I mentioned. Um, but m older engines, you know, they're, they're usually leaking just because of the seals. Um, so you'll want to inspect for that. Um, look for any excessive leaks and uh, squawk those. Any questions about the oil system? Um, maybe one point, because this happens from time to time. Remember that two of our planes in group two have continental engines where nine quarts is the minimum. So A3 Echo currently at Oakland, soon to be a Concord, and the 206 at Palo Alto, don't fly it with less than nine quarts, preferably a little more. So these numbers here are only for the G1182s. Cool, good point, George. All right, anything else? Okay, next is the engine ignition system. I apologize, this picture has only four cylinders, but I think it's a pretty good image. It demonstrates um, how you have a left and a right magneto and how, um, how each of those magnetos drives either the upper or the lower and it's, and it's crisscross. So the right magneto drives the lower right and the upper left and the left magneto drives the um, lower left and upper right spark plugs. The The system is there obviously for redundancy. You know, your car only usually typically has has one ignition system. Um, two differences here from a car and, and, a, and an aircraft engine is the magneto actually generates electricity so it doesn't require the battery or alternator 
or any of that stuff. It actually just literally um, it uses um, permanent magnets and the and the um, spinning motion of the engine to generate a um, periodic pulses of of current that are sent to uh, the appropriate cylinder at the appropriate time. Uh, in addition to the redundancy, the spark plugs provide a, a, a more even burn, uh, a more complete burn. Um, obviously, you want to check that both of these magnetos are working during your run-up and that uh, the maximum drop, RPM drop, as per the POH is 175, and that there isn't a significant difference between the two, uh, no greater than 50 RPM. Um, if you do get a significant drop on one of your mags, sometimes it can be one or two spark plugs that are fouled. Um, fouling occurs when the cylinders are running too cold um, and carbon builds up on the spark plugs and so you can um, attempt to burn that off uh, during your uh, your run-up check by um, using a, a higher rpm and, and leaning it significantly and then rechecking sometimes you know a failed magneto is really, really rough. Um, sometimes, um, really, really different than just a, a a drop in RPM. It just really doesn't run at all on one of the mags, and so that's definitely something you don't want to fly with. Another caution with magnetos is uh, the switch that you turn the key to left and right, and and both, and start. Uh, in the off position, it grounds the magnetos so that when you turn them, when you turn the propeller, or let me rephrase that, when the propeller turns with the starter motor, um, or, you know, by hand, I mean, with CAP, we're not supposed to turn the propeller by hand. Um, you, you have a potential to send electricity to the spark plugs and, and start the engine. But if the magneto is grounded, theoretically, it doesn't send that electricity to the spark plugs. Uh, however, that wire from the switch to the magneto can come loose or fall off or break or be cut. Um, and if that's the case, then you have an ungrounded mag even when your switch is in the off position. And that's why when um, you shut down the engine, uh, you check momentarily that, that, that the mags are grounded properly in the off position. Any questions about that? Nope. Okay, cool. Next is the uh, air induction system. Relatively simple on this aircraft. Uh, consists of the air filter that's very visible from the front of the aircraft. You want to check to make sure that it's not clogged or, or full of dirt or bugs or whatever. Um, some aircraft, all aircraft should have an alternate um, source of, of intake air, induction air. Um, some aircraft have a lever in the cockpit that you can use. This aircraft doesn't. It has an automatic um, alternate air source that basically opens. So if the engine's trying to suck in air and it can't through the air filter, um, a spring-loaded door kind of opens um, and lets air in uh, through the alternate air source. Pretty straightforward. Any questions about that? Okay. Uh, the fuel injection system, we talked a little bit about that before. So this, this is going to inject fuel into the cylinder. Uh, 
many pieces make up the system from the engine uh, driven fuel pump, the, the uh, fuel air control unit, the fuel manifold, fuel flow indicator, and uh, um, the injector nozzles themselves. You need to have uh, the fuel system needs to be under pressure in order to inject the fuel. If your mechanical pump fails, you can use the auxiliary pump to um, help provide that pressure. One of the disadvantages of a fuel injection system is um, can be difficult. Hot starts can be difficult, and that's usually due to um, it's very easy to flood uh, a fuel injected engine. Another issue if you operate uh, in the desert when it's really hot, the ambient temperature is really hot, you, um, after you've shut down the engine and then you go to restart it, uh, the fuel can vaporize in the lines. And um, if it vaporizes far enough back past the mechanical pump, the pump can't generate enough pressure to inject fuel. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, when you have a water pump that has air, you know, it's not going to suck the water out of, out of the lake into wherever you're moving the water. So similar principle. So again, you're going to use the uh, auxiliary pump to try to get that fuel, that liquid fuel, past the mechanical pump and then um, into the cylinders. And maybe uh, one more reminder that the same two of out of five airplanes that I've talked about have carburetors. And study up on that system, it's, it's been a while, but the big thing there is carb ice, which is real. That. Yeah, that was actually one of my questions here. Um, so is a fuel injected engine susceptible to icing? Yeah. Not carburetor icing. <laughs> True. Yeah, not carburetor icing. What what kind of icing? Induction icing. Who said that? Yeah, Eric. Cool. Um, yeah, exactly. So um, you know, we talked a little bit about already the induction, the air induction system, and and if it's blocked, it's going to automatically open and, and air things. So there's really, you know, nothing you can do about um, the uh, the air filter getting getting blocked with ice. Um, but yeah, you can, you should definitely still turn around. You could change altitude. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yep. All the usual stuff, 180 degree turn, climb or descend. I have a little question that relates yeah, to my previous question. The picture you showed before showed fuel injection going straight into the cylinder and you said well that's a wrong picture actually the poh says it goes into the intake prior to the intake valve this slide says it's directly into the cylinder so what is it actually <laughs> yeah well if we go if we go back to that i'm sorry i don't have 100 percent accurate so this this diagram let me get my little pointer here this diagram shows the fuel injector going directly into the cylinder, bypassing the intake. Right. Um, now, this this intake tube right here is part part of the cylinder, if you will. Um, or I mean, there's I don't have a picture of a of a real aircraft cylinder here. I I almost put one in this slide set, um, but there's a tube here that then goes um, elsewhere. But if I could move this injector and just put it right here is is where it is. So it's still it's still connected to the cylinder. But it's it's actually injecting right before the um, the intake valve. So it's it, both statements are true, right? Um, and and yeah, so during pre-flight, you do want to make sure all these hoses or tubes, I should say aren't leaking and they and, and they looking to be good shape good shape they're not kinked that sort of stuff 
Any more questions about the fuel injection system? So there's no alternate air door. Is that correct? There is an alternate air door, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Right, right here. Um, so behind, <laughs> behind here, inside here, there's a spring-loaded uh, door that will automatically open um, if, I guess, it opens by suction. Because if you block this, it'll open that and, and pull air from inside the cowling there. Cool. Thank you. Uh huh. All right. Uh, propeller. Um, an all metal three bladed constant speed governor regulated propeller. Also called a variable pitch. Uh, the important thing is this is uh, controlled by engine oil. So if you lose your engine oil, what happens? It's not so variable pitch anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's just a fixed pitch. And the, the, do we know what pitch it becomes? I'm guessing high RPM. Right, uh, exactly. In a single engine, uh, it turns into low pitch, high RPM. Um, interestingly enough, I really like this cutout, which is why I put it here, but it, it, this appears to be a cutout from a multi-engine um, propeller, which, um, which does the opposite when it loses pressure it it goes to the to the um the feather, feather position that's what i was trying to say yeah um so if you look here you know the important thing is this spring pushes this piston back so if there's no oil pressure to push this piston this way the spring pushes it back um, and that turns the blades right um, so the governor, what is, uh, what is the purpose of the governor, anybody? To adjust the pressure, the oil pressure into that piston so that the propeller maintains a constant RPM, or that the engine maintains a constant RPM. Yeah, exactly. It, it, uh, it controls the flow of oil into that piston. Um, I believe another thing it does is, um, Amplifies the pressure, if you will, because I'm pretty sure, you know, 50 to 90 psi is not going to move this piston. Um, uh, so yeah, the governor basically is is usually connected with uh, a cable. There's a lever on it, and a lever, you know, um, in the cockpit you have you have your propeller control knob. You turn that knob, it moves that cable, it moves that lever on that governor, and causes that governor to to, to push more oil in or release oil um, from that piston and, and moves that blade back and forth. Uh, what is the most desirable propeller pitch for the best glide ratio? Core as high, as high uh, low RPM cores. Right, exactly. Yeah, it, it'd be great if we could feather it. So it's kind of it's kind of an odd thing that the single engine goes to a, a low pitch, high RPM, high drag situation when the engine quits. Hmm. Yeah. Anyways, any questions about the propeller? Could, could it be going that, to that pitch because um, it might be just oil and the engine still operation operational, but that there's just a lower amount of oil, or there's some sort of pressure leak? Yeah, or 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 a failed uh, governor, or you know, yeah, any, any number of those things, right? Yeah, so you know, in a single engine, if you still got if your engine is still turning, you'd like it to actually turn a propeller and, and provide you some some thrust, right? That was just a guess. Yeah, it's a good guess. <laughs> yeah, but there's, uh, total, but there's total oil loss in the engine. I might be the propeller is going to continue spinning. Let me see. OK.
Okay, so the fuel system, we talked a little bit about the fuel injection system, but this is the fuel system as, as a whole and a whole aircraft. Um, to my shock and dismay, when I first started flying this aircraft, 13 fuel drains. That's like 10x for places for fuel to fall out of my uh, out of my um, my system. Uh, but it is what it is. Apparently, there was um, some fuel trapped in some of the between some of the wings bars, and um, so all of these drains now five five drains per wing and uh, three under the under the belly uh, so that we can make sure to get every single last drop of any water or other contaminants that are in the fuel system out. Uh, two fuel vents, very important. Um, what is the purpose of the um, of the fuel vents? So fuel is not vapor locked. Vapor locked. You would create well, a vacuum if it was cemented. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, so basically, if you don't replace, as as you as you draw fuel out of the tanks, if you don't replace it with air, um, two things can happen. You can starve the engine of fuel, or um, <clears throat> collapse the uh, the fuel tank. Um, and I believe in this aircraft, the fuel tank is is um, the wing just coated with some some rubber membrane. It's not a bladder, so theoretically, could that collapse your wing? It's kind of an interesting thing to think about. So as you're doing your pre-flight, don't just you know bypass that vent. It's a very important part of of uh, of the aircraft. And there's one on each wing. <clears throat> Has that happened? Um, I I did a little research and it's it's happened to cars. <laughs> huh, okay. Um, it's it's uh, you can yeah you can on the internet you can find pictures of car gas tanks that have been collapsed. Um, also of note, if you read the POH, the the um, fuel caps have a vacuum breaker in them. So theoretically, if 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 the built-in vent isn't isn't functioning or clogged, um, you should be able to draw some air in through the fuel cap. Now, both of those are clogged and broken. Um, you know, then you, you start to have this, this, this condition. Uh, so the three under the belly, I believe if you look at this diagram, um, one will drain underneath the <coughs> fuel selector. The other will drain under the aux pump and um, Finally, uh, the uh, the one under the fuel strainer. <clears throat> what do you do if fuel becomes unbalanced between the left and right wings? Switch. You can uh, turn the uh, selector and just burn Switch. off one wing to equalize it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you want to put that back to both before landing uh, or before running out of fuel on one side? Uh, what are some of the reasons it would become unbalanced? If you're doing uh, turns, if you're doing you know, like a search, might be circling and uh, fuel would go to one side. Mm -hmm. That should right. happen if you fly coordinated. <laughs> so, no, it, seriously, it's an indicator of how coordinated you're flying all along. If, even if you, you're in a turn, if perfectly coordinated, that shouldn't happen. I'm not sure I agree with that because you still have gravity. Could also be because uh, I'm sitting on one side of the plane. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, another one, actually, we've talked about fuel caps um, uh, or the vent. You know, if a vent is clogged or, or a fuel cap uh, isn't sealing properly, uh, you can it, it can draw faster from one side than the other. Um, so you definitely want to keep an eye on that while you're flying. Um, you know, you don't want to go way out and and um, use up all your fuel in, in one tank. 
and uh, have to come all the way back. Um, I mean, it's really, you'd like to have balanced fuel for maneuvers um, and landing and, and things like that, landing and taking off, but um, yeah, I mean, one thing you can do if you're if you're searching, if you're circling over over a crash site or something, you know, you can just turn around and start turning the other way, right? That's one thing you could do. Any questions about the fuel system? Um, a little note that the POH actually shows 12 drains in the diagram for some reason, but we have 13. As Eric said, that was before the attorneys got there. <laughs> All right, important numbers. Um, 92 gallons total. I don't think we can put three CP members in if we filled it up. So that's kind of a, a useless number for us. Um, tabs. Uh, so if you were to take your plane and get it filled to the tabs, that would be. Um, 64 usable gallons. Uh, CAP typically flies these planes with 50 gallons or fuels them to 50 gallons with the 100 low lead blue or the 100 green. I've never seen 100 green around here, so pretty sure it's going to be the 100 low lead blue. Um, you will get erroneous indications on your fuel gauges in skids and slips and unusual attitudes. Um, you may even get a low fuel warning uh, momentarily. Don't panic if, if, you, <laughs> if you've been keeping track of how much fuel you have, uh, you're probably okay. Um, you know, obviously, uh, if it stayed, if the warning stayed on, you, you might want to heed that, but they do come on and off. Uh, don't take off with fuel in the yellow. And it's a good tool to um, to reset your totalizer. Uh, it's on the checklist, so you're probably not going to miss it. All right, uh, moving right along. Um, brake system. It's a single disc hydraulic X. Actuated brake, one on each um, main wheel. The important thing to know is there's uh, uh, the tube, the hydraulic lines, they go from basically behind the rotor pedal, uh, each rotor pedal, and by each I just mean left and right, you don't have four brake cylinders. Um, you have a master brake cylinder behind the rudder pedal and then the, the tube goes out the fuselage and down the landing gear to the um, brake caliper. Uh, so, you know, if you, if, you, if you get in the plane and you see a bunch of typically red fluid all around the rudder pedals, you, you can you have an idea, you might not have your brakes. Uh, you're also looking for that red hydraulic fluid le leaking out of any of these connections, any of these any of these connections here or down the bottom here, off of the bleed um, valve, and the rotor. Looking for any cracks or excessive grooves. Any questions about the brake system? Oh, cool. All right, uh, cabin heating and ventilation. You have a knob in the cockpit to control heat and air. And uh, defrost. One important thing to One important thing to know is um, carbon monoxide 
can enter the cabin through the uh, the cabin heat. The reason being is this shroud is literally wrapped around your exhaust or your uh, your muffler, if you will, uh, and it has a tube, a scat tube that goes right into the cockpit. Um, and so if your muffler is cracked or leaking, uh, that can bring carbon monoxide into the cockpit. Uh, fresh air uh, for the overhead vents comes from these holes in the wings here. Uh, so um, during your pre-flight, make sure there isn't bird's nest, stuff like that in there. Um, the cabin air knob actually opens. Um, some of the planes have a vent on each side. Uh, some of them have just one on, on one side. On the other side of the fuselage here is, is uh, the fresh air as well. Um, if there's an engine fire, you want to close off the um, the heat and the air knobs. You can leave these, these upper vents because they're completely separate uh, and they don't draw air from around the engine. Uh, what do you do if you su suspect um, carbon dioxide? is in the cockpit. I would say open the windows and land immediately. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah, sa same thing. Close close these. Uh, close the cabin heat because it's likely coming from this shroud. Uh, is there any um, de-icing equipment on this aircraft? No. One one vote for no. Anyone else? Uh, there is the, the um, forgot hot pedo air. heat. Does it have pedo heat? Yeah. Yeah. So hot it's air definitely. around the uh, the windshield there, just on that that last slide. Oh yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So you don't think of this aircraft as as being equipped for icing, but yeah, it has the pedo heat, uh, which is kind of critical, um, and. Uh, the defrost, and that's that's kind of related to this this slide here is um, this cabin heat or this uh, this defrost here uh, is for the windshield. So if your window's icing up, having trouble seeing out, uh, you can turn that on. So onto the pitot static system, pitot tube on the left wing there. Uh, make sure it's unobstructed. The cap is removed from it if it has one, the cover. Uh, so in this aircraft, because of the G1000, you know, a lot of these sensors, and um, Marty will go into this in more detail, uh, through the um, air data computer, feeds the RAM airspeed into the G1000 system. Uh, it's also connected to the traditional standby analog instruments. Any questions about this? Uh, I'll ask a question. So both the G1000 and the standby air, airspeed indicators suddenly display zero. What do you sus suspect happened and uh, what can you do about it? Pedo tubes Pedo clogged up somehow. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Um, Pedo tube is, is blocked or, uh, or iced over. Um, Really, the only thing you can do while you're flying is apply the pitot heat. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the vertical speed? Vertical speed and altimeter appear to be stuck. They, they aren't changing when climbing or descending. Go to old and static. Old static, yeah. So same thing on the side of the plane. Maybe some ice covered uh, or a bug or something covered the static port. Um, use the alternate static source, which in this aircraft is the red knob. Next to the throttle, just pull that out. Uh, is there any other way? If that doesn't work, is there any other way to 
to get alternate air into the, um, the static system. There's something about breaking the altimeter glass, but kind of yeah. an extreme case. Yeah, that's the one. So yeah, you can let you can let air in, cabin air, static air, if you will, directly into that system by cracking the glass on either the um, the altimeter or the uh, vertical speed. Uh, don't have vertical speed in this aircraft. You do have vertical speed in this aircraft, but it's digital. Um, so you <laughs> don't crack the G1000. Don't check. Don't don't crack the PFD. That won't help. Uh, can you fly without an airspeed indication? Sure. Yeah. Sure. BFR. Yeah, the airplane doesn't know the airspeed indicator isn't working. Yeah, exactly. So so. So definitely in, in VFR, it should be relatively easy to fly without a, a, an airspeed indicator. Uh, in IFR, probably more challenging. Um, w one thing I've learned over the years is is to listen. Um, you know, they tell you not to in, in the clouds to fly by the seat of your pants. That is absolutely 100% true. Um, <clears throat> do not try to fly the plane in the cloud by the seat of your pants. But um, you can definitely pay attention to listen, I mean, to sounds. Um, you can. You can hear the difference between air speeds. Um, so just pay attention to what you know the normal sounds of, of, of normal air speeds are. And if things get really, really quiet, you're you're probably getting closer to stall than than a, a good cruise speed or something like that. And a little bit of a spoiler for those who are qualified pilots. We're running an emergency procedures flight clinic. One of the things in the syllabus is fly and land without an airspeed indicator. In the clouds. Oh, wait. No. Inverted. Inverted in the clouds. No. Yeah, no, it's a great exercise. Uh, definitely everyone should do that. Get, get used to that. Um, the uh, last slide on my slides here is the the vacuum system and instruments so it's kind of a funny thing on this particular aircraft because of the g1000 and all the electronics and sensors and all that are there uh, the only reason we have a vacuum system and pump is for our alternate our standby attitude indicator this one in the center here right here um So it's a whole lot of stuff just for that little, that little guy there, but it's very critical uh, for IFR flight. Uh, the diagram shows, so basically what happens here is the, the air is drawn in through a filter to keep the contaminants out of the instrument. Um, the air uh, flows over, we'll call it a turbine or something that, that spins spins the gyro uh, so you don't want any uh, contaminants from the air in there uh, it's also connected to this transducer that gives you the vacuum indicator on the g1000 the vacuum indication another sensor that could fail so you could have you know this this transducer could fail and you could it would show no vacuum but possibly you would still have vacuum uh, if your instrument is still showing accurate on the ground, for example. Uh, you have a regulator to, to keep your, your vacuum pump from drawing too much air and possibly sp spinning your instrument too fast. And then it just ejects the air overboard. No filter necessary on that side. Uh, occasionally, you'll get a low vacuum warning under under a thousand rpm generally um, not the end of the world uh, just confirm you know by revving it up over a thousand to make sure that it, it goes away if it doesn't then yeah you, you do have a problem also if your um, attitude indicator your standby attitude indicator is lazy during the taxi like it's not indicating a level while you're on level ground um, that's that's of concern um, so the question for you is can you fly if while taxiing you notice that your your attitude indicator is is indicating a turn, but you're actually flat on the ground. Anybody? Well, if it's VFR, I would have to look it up in the uh, uh, the little table 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kinds of kinds of equipment list. Yeah. So in the um, in the POH is the kinds of equipment list because, um, you know, planes stuff breaks all the time. Right. You know, and, but we don't need every single part. You know, do we need every single light? Do we need every single instrument? Um, and that's why we have the kinds of equipment list. It'll tell us exactly what the manufacturer and, and the FAA has agreed upon as to what is legal to fly under what conditions. So uh, it's true. The um, the standby atti attitude indicator is not required for VFR flight. Um, so if you're out at a remote base or, or remote air, 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 airport and uh, your attitude indicator breaks, your standby attitude indicator breaks, you can still fly home in VFR conditions. You don't have to sit there and wait for someone to come fix it or walk home. All right, any questions about the vacuum system? Um, why are the arrows pointing from the vacuum pressure transducer toward the attitude indicator? Yeah, it's a great question. So right here, so remember this is the this is the um, the vacuum pump. So it's sucking air this way, and and it's sucking air this way. And so the transducer, it's also sucking air from the transducer. It's creating a vacuum here, and this thing will measure how much vacuum is being created, right? So that's it's not actually drawing air through it. It's literally just creating a vacuum. Like if you were to put your finger over the end of a straw and suck on it, um, and then this transducer is going to measure that amount of suction. Okay. Or negative pressure, if you will, and turn that into a digital signal that it gives to um, the uh, the air data computer, or or it does appear that it goes directly from the engine and airframe unit directly. I'm not sure that's accurate, but it definitely shows up as a little <laughs> little thing on your screen there. Cool. Any other questions? Okay, great. Uh, went about 15 minutes over over time on my slides, but um, now Marty's going to take it over and talk about the electrical system. Awesome, thank you. I think it should be fine because I've got fewer slides, so I'm just going to put myself up just for a second so you can see that I'm a live person and not a computer. So let me share. All right. Okay, are those slides showing up okay? Yep. Okay, awesome, yeah. thank you. All right, so electrical system, it's really easy. It's one, two, six, 28, or I just did this for fun. So yeah, one alternator, uh, there's two batteries, two 24 volt batteries. I, at my form five, I didn't answer this correctly because uh, anyway, I'll get to that. Uh, then there's six buses, uh, in the standards uh, Cessna 182 G1000, there's actually an additional CAP mission bus that I didn't put in the count here. Uh, and then it's a 28 volt system. That's what I didn't get right on my uh, Form 5. They corrected me. There's no way to, I said 24 volt, but there's no way to charge a 20 volt, 4 volt system unless you have the ability to handle more than, tw than 24 volts. So uh, that's that's why that came. Now, Let's go to the actual meat of this. So again, I kind of followed Eric's lead. So I have little quotes uh, occasionally from the POH. So we do have a 28 volt DC system. We have a belt driven alternator. And I believe we have the 60 amp uh, alternator. Maybe somebody can correct me if I'm, I got that wrong. Uh, not, you can get a 95 amp, but I believe we probably have a 60. Uh, so two different types of alternators you can handle in this system. The main battery, there's actually two different uh, capacities that you could get an eight or a 10 amp hour. There's a power distribution module, and that's actually what's uh, in this uh, outline here. Actually, let me look at this, pointer options. So if you look at, uh, this is the um, power distribution module. Also, they call it a J box. Uh, and that's actually covers this whole area here it's in the dashed lines. And then the additional, because of the computers, uh, the need to be able to have some type of a backup, we have a standby battery and that's a 6.2 amp hour. And so you can see from those numbers, that's not a lot of capacity if you lose the alternator. Um, and we'll we'll get into that. So that's why understanding electrical system and this uh, aircraft is is really important. 
uh, a lot of electronics. A any questions so far on this slide? Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out is in this uh, aircraft, there's actually a standby battery and there's actually a test that's done as part of the pre-flight. And it actually puts a three amp current uh, a load onto the battery. And what it does is it measures the voltage. To, and if the voltage is 24 volts or higher, which means the battery is not collapsing, uh, then it illum illuminates the light. And so to pass that test, it's only a 10 second load of three amps. Uh, and that that basically passes that test. So that doesn't really tell you if the battery is going to hold up as long as we think it will if we actually lose the electrical system. But um, just to keep that in mind, so battery life is going to be dependent on battery condition. Uh, okay. And one other thing, this, this does have a lot of details. It does show the mags uh, being controlled by the ignition switch. It does show uh, battery and alternator connections. Uh, and the, we're, we're going to talk about this, but really the key parts of this are being able to control the alternator, whether it's in the circuit or not. Um, and that's, uh, we'll talk about resetting the alternator. That's one of the recoveries if you do have some, some several types of uh, electrical failures. And we'll talk about those. Uh, those are the main things. Uh, yeah, those are the main things. But just keep in mind, and, and, and when you're doing the pre-fly, you'll see that there are two amps two ammeters in this aircraft and two voltmeters. So um, it, it's, it's good to think about what you're, what you're checking when you're doing the pre-flight. Uh, any questions before I go to the next slide? I kind of tend to go fast and actually, Eric, I can't see anything as far as hands up or anything. So if anybody does raise a hand or put something in the chat, uh, let me know. I think everybody's been speaking up. Will do. Okay. OK, so as I said, the electrical system, and this is a diagram out of the POH. Uh, this is a description of the, the boatload of buses and electronics that we have. And why, the, why is this so important? Well, it, it's critical, and as Eric alluded to, we have electric flaps. It's probably one key item. Um, we obviously have electric radios that we care about. So if we do have an electrical failure, we've got to know how to pare down the system to, to what we need to survive uh, and, and be successful landing. Uh, the first uh, electrical bus one uh, right here is controlled with the master switch uh, and that that controls your aux fuel pump, flashing beacon, landing light, overhead lights and flaps. So this is a key item right here. Uh, electrical bus one. Electrical bus two is also controlled by the main the same uh, master switch. So you have no ability to switch off one or one or or other of these buses. They're both on um, if your master switch is on. Uh, electrical bus two drives pedo heat, uh, stall detector heaters. Actually, there's another uh, anti-icing item. Well, the stall detector has a heater. I'll throw that in since Eric was talking about anti-icing. Uh, uh, the um, we have some navigation lights, taxi lights. So it's kind of interesting electrical buses that splits up taxi light and landing light onto separate buses. But as I said, they're they're all controlled by the same switch and the the same power. So that what's feeding these two main buses? What well, actually what is feeding those two main buses on this aircraft? I'll ask that question. The power from the alternator. That's right, alternator. If the alternator fails, then what's next? Batteries. Yep, the main, main battery. So right, whenever I, right. yeah, we, yeah, when we go through this, we're going to always have main battery or standby because it's going to be important to understand uh, what's happening. But yes, that's exactly right. So that's what's feeding those two, uh, those two buses. That there's one bus here. It's a cross feed bus. It's really um, just a way to allow the two buses to interconnect. And there's diodes to protect, uh, protect the buses. But the crossfeed bus does actually have some equipment on it, like the some of the critical things like stall warning, autopilot warning, et cetera. Um, the ever important uh, Hobbs meter, uh, so that always would work. Uh, and then the um, alternate uh, and the master switch also. But uh, th so that's kind of the main buses. Now, if we move over to the right, we have the unique aspect of the G1182, which is now we actually have two avionics buses. 
and avionics bus one, and they're not symmetrical. Uh, so also keep that in mind um, when you're uh, when you're you're uh, kind of looking at the way the aircraft's laid out. Uh, avionics bus one gives you your PFD, which is your left hand display, which the pilot is normally using. Gives your air data computer, which is critical. Uh, your attitude indicator or AHARS, we call it. Um, uh, you get nav one, com one, are on here, and a DME if you if you have one. Our aircraft do not have a DME. Uh, that's correct, right, George? I don't believe we have it. We don't have a distinct DME. We don't have a VHF DME, no. Okay, thank you. And uh, we don't have the storm scope. We don't have some of these uh, some of these systems, but. And also, here's the critical unit here on on avionics bus one, the airframe unit, engine and airframe. So that's where we, you know, uh, we talked about. Eric talked about all the sensors that are connected in. So if we actually lose this, we would lose all those sensors. If we lost avionics bus one, uh, as an example, if you flipped out, flip that switch off. Um, we do have a storm scope. It's just that we don't have storms, so we we don't even use it. <laughs> Thanks, George. <laughs> OK, now avionics bus two. It is it is it is very parallel. So I have a display. So we have a, another computer display that we have off this bus. We have a transponder. Uh, we have nav two, uh, com two. We have an audio panel. This is going to be important later when I talk about failures. We have actually audio panel on one of our avionics buses. Uh, and then autopilot is also on one of our avionics buses. And we'll talk about it uh, later when we talk about failures, how, how to try and, and keep the system running as long as possible. Now, the final bus I want to talk about um, on this slide is the essential bus. Um, and this is critical because if everything else fails, the main battery and the alternator, we have a, a standby battery that will power just the essential bus. And so what will that give us? That will give us a PFD. Air data computer, AHARS, so that we can see if it right side up. Uh, we have nav one, so we can still navigate. We've got an engine airframe unit. So that way we can tell what the engine's doing. And we do have a COM1. Uh, but we don't have lights, for example. Uh, so probably important to, uh, if you're flying at night and you've lost everything and you were, you were down to just your standby battery, um, you may have an issue with uh, lights to see other things in the cockpit. The display itself will be lit, um, but other things may not be. Uh, and so that's that's a critical bus to understand. Uh, let's see if I missed anything here. Avionics bus one, two, cross speed. No, that's the main buses. Uh, any questions on this slide? So this is very important. Um, to, to go through and kind of to think about when you're uh, using this this aircraft and oh I should I should have said I'm a low time G1000 Cessna 182 pilot so as opposed to Eric so uh, any other questions on this slide? I, I think it's worth pointing out um, that how few things are, are on the essential bus. Just, I mean, they're there, but just everybody realizes, like, you don't have flaps, you don't have any outside lights, you don't have a transponder, <laughs> you only have one com, and, of course, the main battery will still power everything if the alternator dies, but there's no guarantee how long the main battery is going to last. Yep. So, yep, yep. That's very good. Yeah, we'll talk about how to stretch it. They had some good ideas uh, in the in the POH about trying to stretch if you, if you lose the alternator. Uh, excuse me? All right, so let's go to the next one. Um, there is one other bus, and I, well, Eric and I, we, when we were reviewing the slides, uh, creating them, we kind of went back and forth about how many buses there are. Um, there actually is another bus in CAP aircraft, um, and it's the mission bus. Um, it has a mission master, and it is actually under the, the you know, the, the main, uh, the main master. So if you turn off the main master, this bus also gets turned off. But it's just it's good to know because you might be having extra load uh, that you don't know is there because one of the checklist items is to turn on the mission master. Um, and so if you do get in trouble and your battery um, is running everything, you don't want to necessarily have the cap radio and the Becker and all these other things. Um, you might need a maybe this may be a, a radio that you need for some reason. Uh, so then you could power down the other systems discreetly. 
but it's just something to keep in mind. And it also, this controls aux power, so this can feed out power to other things. Uh, like if we have a, um, a uh, what do you call those? A, uh, this is a GPS uh, a spot system, or whatever they're called, the different trackers that we have. So basically that stuff will be running off your battery if you were in an emergency and you wouldn't remember. So just keep in mind you have another bus as well. And you have another set of circuit breakers. Uh, any questions on the cap, uh, the mission bus? Can any of these buses take power from somewhere? Take power from somewhere. Yeah, um, if, you, if you were there with a big battery with you. Oh, could, could we you actually have, them? I'll go I'll go back to this. Um, right here on this slide, it, it, there's actually an input into the, into the PDU right here. Uh, for external power, which is really nice. I mean, I'll just do a little aside, and maybe George or other people covered this, but actually I spent a lot of time in our airplane with an external power supply playing with the G1000 um, to learn all of this uh, when I was trying to learn G1000. So that's that's one place. Is that what you meant? Well, that's on the outside, isn't it? The connector yeah. to that thing? Yeah, there's no other so way I... that I, yeah. I don't know of any other way to plug in to provide power. Maybe okay. somebody can chime in if they know a secret. Yeah, I don't think there's any other way. There's plenty of ways to take power. <laughs> right. I was thinking there's, I mean, there are these devices for cars. I don't have any personal experience with them, but I've seen them where you sort of, if you if you don't quite oh, have oh. enough power, you can jack your... into the uh, the lighter socket from yep. another source and actually yeah, we do have work. A, we do have a lighter socket. Um, that would probably be an interesting question. Uh, can you just note that, Eric? I'm gonna I'm gonna ask about that and see if there's any possibility of plugging in just for fun. But yeah, thanks for bringing that up. The other uh, item here was we actually have had cases where uh, this aux power, which goes tr back through like the back seats, has been known to uh, cause static sometimes. And so sometimes if you turn off the aux power uh, that's on the mission master or on the mission bus, um, sometimes the static in the radio is improved. So that's just a little, um, interesting point uh, to try sometime if it happens to you. Okay, uh, I thought this was interesting. This isn't in the, at least I don't, I don't remember being this being in the normal um, procedures in the normal checklist, um, but in the POH, it calls out prior to at night an instrument flying uh, that uh, during run up when you're doing, you know, right after you do the magneto check, um, that you would turn on all electrical equipment that you need uh, for a night flight or instrument flight, and then verify the ammeter shows zero or positive current. Um, and verify the voltmeter is showing that the, your, your system's still charging. So in other words, your alternator is supplying everything you need, uh, and your alternator control unit is working. Uh, so with this picture up to the right, this is actually a snippet of a G1000. Would that uh, meet this requirement if I had all the equipment on? Marty, did you say that picture shows uh, a situation where it does meet that requirement? I'm, a I'm asking if it, if it, it would, would oh, you? Okay. No. no, clearly it does not. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, it, it, I don't know where this picture came from. I just saw it and I had several, I mean, I wanted something to show to talk about, but yeah, this, this shows uh, main bus, uh, main bus voltage is 27, which is, uh, is uh, not good. Uh, the essential bus is at 27, which actually that might be okay. The big issue is the main bus is actually dis main, the main battery is is uh, is discharging. Um, does somebody have a, a comment? Oh. No, I just echoed what you said. Oh, okay, okay, and the, I mean it, it does show the standby the standby battery is seeing some charge, which is good. But anyway, just. This is one area I'm, I'm still, to be honest, when I look at this, all these numbers in the G1000, I still have trouble uh, internalizing them. Um, uh, I'm, I came from round dial days, and so I still struggle with a lot of these, um, but that's why I really think it was good for me to do this, to try and think about it. But any questions on the alternator I, check? I assume yes. it's highlighting those numbers because of that low value is that right yes yes yeah the g1000 will highlight so you'll have numbers that'll turn red um, or be amber as in this case exactly so yeah it'll bring your attention to it okay here we go 
All right, so here we'll talk about enunciators. Um, I apologize, this is kind of a busy slide, um, but uh, there's a, and actually a lot of things I'd like to talk about in this. And Eric, you'll have to, uh, you know, pull me in with the shepherd's crook if I go too long. But anyway, some of the critical enunciators, low volts. Uh, so this is going to happen if you have thrown an alternator belt or something's wrong with your alternator. Uh, your alternator may have uh, had a surge and gone offline. Uh, and so the cycling procedure is right here. And actually, one caveat is that all of this stuff is uh, it should mirror the POH, but the POH and the the CAPS checklists are the master documents. So and, and uh, please keep that in mind with this presentation. Uh, and OK, but to, to cycle the alternator, the alt the alt side of the master goes off. Uh, you verify that the alt field circuit breaker is in. And actually, I found this diagram, and I think this is correct. Maybe George or somebody with a lot of time can verify that that's the correct location um, for the alt field breaker. Um, it looked about right to me, but I wasn't sure. Well, the avionics switch is different. Oh, okay. So this might not be the right aircraft. Yeah, so it's not. Yeah, I don't think they said G1000 aircraft. Okay, ignore this picture. Well, it's actually, it's got avionics bus one and two. I, I'm pretty sure it is a... Uh, I, yeah, I, but but in our planes, it's not there. Uh, yeah, exactly. The switch, yeah. yeah, and the switch Sorry is not there either. It, also, it's definitely a different model. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And also on the G1000, the circuit breakers, you can you can see also the different buses. Um, if it's on bus one, bus two, the emergency bus, what each breaker is connected to. Awesome. Okay, thanks. But the key thing is, uh, so you're going to have to check for the alt field circuit breaker. The reason you have to check that that one is if that circuit breaker's popped, your alternator's out of the circuit. So you've got to make sure that's in. Uh, and then you're going to try and, and turn on the alternator side. If you're still low volts, you're going to have to shed voltage and land. Or you're going to have to shed load and land. So this is where it becomes key to look at your, uh, your ammeter uh, to try and, and voltmeter to try and first figure out what's happening for sure. Um, and then figure out what to do. And so this is where we get into some interesting things. Actually, uh, also I do a little picture of the G1000. This is um, on the on the uh, PFD, on the right-hand side of the PFD, you've got the enunciators that come up and you also have a, a soft key that's gonna start blinking at you. And wh when it's a warning, it's also gonna give you an aural tone. Uh, so you probably should pay attention to these when they pop up. And I know the instructors get really upset if you don't respond to these. Um, but also it pops up here in red, so it's pretty pretty hard to miss. The one interesting thing is uh, you can think about now we, we talked about this flaps are on the main battery. So if I just let the main battery if I shed load, but let the main battery keep running everything. Um, what, what's going to happen is the main battery is going to keep running. Um, and you're actually going to be draining that and your 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 standby battery is going to be fully charged. So one, one strategy they talked about in the POH is actually turn off the alt and battery to off. Now, one, what, what problem is, is then you're only gonna be having the essential bus. So now we have to remember only those items on the essential bus are gonna be powered. Um, so this is one strategy they talked about. I'm gonna talk about another caveat of doing that though. You need to do some things with the comm units before you switch off uh, the, main, the main bus because Switching off the main bus, you lose your audio panel. OK, the other thing to look for is let's say you did this and you've still got the main battery uh, held in reserve. Um, you're not using anything off of it. You're running off a standby battery, which gives you what 20 or 20 minutes or something like that. Of course, you're trying to find some place to go um, at that point in time. Um, the other thing that can happen is your standby battery. When it gets to 20 volts, you're almost done with that battery. So that's another thing to be watching for. You can watch the voltage on the standby battery. Um, the other thing that can happen is you can get a low voltage warning when you're taxiing, low RPM. As Eric said, there's other cases with vacuum, et cetera, where that can happen. As long as it doesn't appear during run up, you should be fine. Uh, the other thing that's interesting though, is the KOEL, the, the equipment list. Actually, you are allowed to fly without the standby battery. Um, in all conditions uh, in the US, um, but in, in Europe, you can't, which I thought was pretty interesting. I don't know if I would do that, but 
Um, anyway, again, uh, I just thought it was an interesting point. All right, so the way it works is if you, let's say you leave both the main battery um, and the standby battery running, the main battery is gonna keep supplying power until the main battery drops below 20 volts. Once it drops below 20 volts, the standby battery will automatically uh, start supplying power. Uh, and it says for at least 30 minutes, but as I said, that it depends on maintenance on the battery and a lot of other uh, uh, situations. And also, it, it, you, know, you, you, you still have loading uh, that's on the essential bus. Um, so if your PFD is up to you know, full brightness, for example, it's gonna take a little more power. Um, so the warning I have about the, um, if, you, if you do lose and go to the essential bus is if you, if you turn off avionics bus two manually to shed power, the problem with doing that is when you turn off avionics bus two, you lose the, the audio panel. So what the POH says to do is um, before you turn that bus, t bus two off, you wanna set uh, COM1 to be the, uh, the microphone and the um, uh, you know, transmit and receive um, so that that way when you lose the, the audio panel, you don't have a problem with the radios. Um, so can somebody, uh, George, or somebody who's actually gone through this, is, is that accurate, what I've read? I've not experienced that in the 172. I've, I've seen the opposite, that when you shut down Avionics Bus 2, mm -hmm. um, you still, it automatically, you only have um, uh, COM 1, but it is available. It's it's no different. Okay. But, but yeah, I've, I've, the 172 has the same thing in the POH. It's just not been my experience. Okay. What do you mean is available? Is well, what's, oh, what's can, supposed to go what, to COM 1? Well, what the POH says is that if you, let's say you were transmitting or receiving on COM 2, and then you, you, then, and then you turned off avionics bus, bus 2, that you would have, the, that the COM and NAV could not be tuned, is what it says. And I don't know, it seems confusing to me. And so they say you should switch to COM 1 uh, for transmit or receive before you turn off the audio panel. So you if you, I, I think... Two. I thought it's, that was because when the audio panel shuts off, it defaults to COM one. Exactly. That that's yeah. what it is. But there's something about it. So I, I let's maybe we can just log that, Eric. I'll see if I can find out more detail. Yeah, I I had that with um, with Keith when I was uh, checking out in the 172, and he agreed. Okay. That's perfect. That POH is misleading or incorrect in that in that area. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um. Any, all right, so any questions on low volts? So it is, you can see why we might want to uh, save our main battery and use up the standby, right? Because then when we're landing, we might have the ability to put down flaps, which could help us if we're not a good pilot. Like I'm, I'm still working on my no flap landings. It's uh, always a challenge. Um, anyway, that was sort of a joke, sort of. Um, okay, the other caution that could come up is standby battery. Uh, and what happens here is the standby battery is drawing too much amperage. Uh, and so what that means is a standby battery should be charging uh, in a normal flight. So that means something's wrong. It could be uh, one of the diodes or some other problem where uh, the, the standby battery is not getting charged or the essential bus is not getting power for some reason. Um, and so again, this is another case where you're gonna have to monitor what's happening with the main bus and, and essential bus and try to figure out what to do. Uh, any questions on, on this slide? Okay, 831. All right, I think I'm doing okay. All right, electrical failures, failures continued. Um, another problem that we can have is we can have excessive charging. So if something goes wrong with the, the unit that is controlling the output of the um, alternator, what can happen is um, the alternator can get taken out of the circuit. Uh, and and that's what's what's going to happen is if, if you've been charged if you've been going for 30 minutes and your M bus amperage um, it should be less than five amps so it means it's not continuing to charge um, if it keeps charging with a high um, high amount of amperage the battery uh, can have problems basically so what will happen is if that if that's happening and you have excessive voltage greater than almost 32 volts uh, you're going to get the high volts warning will pop up on the PFD. Uh, and the alternator will get kicked out of the circuit. 
And so then you're going to have problems, right? Because you are start, you're now running on battery power alone. And uh, at this point, uh, we talked about it could be that you could try to cycle the alternator to bring it back online. Um, but um, essentially, the and you have to see if it gets kicked out again. Uh, you don't want to keep doing this. If it gets kicked out or you have excessive voltage, you're going to burn up uh, parts of your system. And so you basically have to leave it off, shed electrical load, and land. And again, this is a, where you can use the MBUS amps is what you're looking at uh, to make this determination. Uh, that can tell you how much amperage you're pulling out of your system. And again, we talked about the amount of capacity on the batteries. It's not huge. Uh, so you, you want to be decreasing amperage as much as you can. As I said, you might want to turn the Mission Master off. You might want to turn off Avionics Bus, bus 2. Um, do all these kinds of things to try and, and stretch your battery life. Uh, any questions? Hey, Marty, I'd like to get people's opinion on something. It seems sure. like excessive voltage can also be uh, regulated by reducing power reducing throttle you're spinning yeah, the alternator less oh i see what you're saying i don't know if that's true if you can actually decrease it enough to the to where it would because basically i think the voltage out of the alternator is is pretty high i think it's regulated but maybe somebody else is really knowledgeable that's, that's, you know that's a, yeah yeah i'd like to hear other opinions that's a really good point that it's already regulated to 28 volts at, at near idle. Yeah, that's a really valid point. Yeah, I'm not sure. Is anybody yeah, know? I, I, I think you'd have to get it below like 600 RPM to to, uh, yeah. to actually start reducing voltage. OK, yeah. so you'd have yeah, to put yourself in another really kind of emergency. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you're right. It's at 28 volts on the, at, at taxi or idle speed. And so, yeah, cool. Thank okay. you. You bet, you bet. Any other questions? All right, so I kind of found this article. Um, I've got I've got a reference to this. I think this was on um, um, Bold. I can't remember what it's called, Bold something. But anyway, I put the uh, website in the references. But I like this checklist. So basically, if your alternator's failed, you've got electrical system failure, you try to reset it, didn't work. So then you've got to figure out, you know, what's your flight condition? Well, VFR, IMC, if you're VFR, obviously you can shut down a heck of a lot of equipment and nobody cares. Um, you, you, all you really need is a, a, it'd be nice to have a radio working and uh, navigation, um, but you can lose a lot of, a lot of the extra load, uh, obviously. IMC, pretty challenging, right? Um, you may have a difficult time uh, shutting off uh, tons of your equipment. If you lose your transponder, for example, if you lose some of these things that are, you're being tracked with, uh, it can be more challenging. And obviously IMC, you might be at night, other things where you're using a lot of power anyway. So that can be challenging. So if the, the rule here is if you're IMC and have this kind of problem come up, if you hit VFR, you wanna try and stay there, but you wanna try and get out of IMC um, as fast as you can. What, you wanna think about how much time you have. So we talked about the, you know, if you lose um, your electrical system, you've got maybe 20, uh, 30 minutes on the standby battery to, on the essential bus. And then you also have this other pool of power in your main battery. So you really have to kind of think about how you're gonna handle those two pools of power um, and, how, and how long you can last. And you can look at the amp, amp meter uh, and, and try and figure out you know, what's gonna happen um, based on how bigger batteries are. Um, this happens during the, the check rides. Uh, something goes wrong and your instructor says, okay, find the airport, uh, you, know, you know, you just lost your power. And so remember, nearest airport feature of G1000 is awesome feature. Um, one thing I forgot to do in a check ride is to, I looked up the nearest airport and I kind of headed that direction, but I didn't hit direct to so that I had a nice uh, magenta line. Um, so don't forget to just follow through all the way. Look up nearest airport, that you think is going to work. Um, in this kind of case, an electrical failure, if you're VFR and your electrical failure, uh, it's not as big a deal at uh, daytime, um, you might want to think about, well, can this nearest airport actually fix the issue? Um, uh, because it's not really uh, what I consider an emergency like it is an IMC. IMC, you're going to have to figure out, um, you don't care where you get down to. Uh, you want to get down to an airport um, before you lose your batteries. Um, another interesting point in the article was, you know, you want a landing clearance, 
Um, uh, obviously, they, they might be expecting and, and use a light gun if, if you've squawked, uh, I think, 7600 for uh, lost comms. Um, but you can also use your cell phone. And uh, they said that you can call uh, the weather station uh, and they can actually either give you the number for the tower to call the tower. Um, so those are some alternatives to think about, which I didn't really think about to try and get clearance. Uh, any comments, uh, questions on this? This is kind of. Yeah, one thing we did with an alternator failure was we still had the radio. And, and so we asked approach for the number for the tower and wrote it down in case we lost the radios. Oh, awesome. Thank you. I yeah. was kind of. That, that's that's a great idea. So get numbers while you have a radio. I like that. Any other questions, comments? OK, so I'm going to touch on avionics. There's not a lot of detail here because and this is somewhat review. The reason it's critical is because of where these devices sit on the buses. Um, and so this is a refresher, I think, from I think you already covered the G1000 uh, line units. Um, but this kind of just lays it out and what gets interesting and I should have done this, um, Eric, now that I think about it is kind of show who, who is powering these different systems. Uh, that would have been a neat overlay. Um, but this kind of shows how you have a layout. You've got you've got two GIAs, which are kind of like your integrated avionics. You've got one on each side. Those are powered on different avionics buses. You've got two computer displays powered on different avionics buses, but one audio panel um, actually that brings up a question. Does anybody know what powers the other audio panel? Is it on the essential bus or is it on the where is it? Because we've got a we got a we got another one compared to normal ones. Anybody know the, know that answer? OK, I'll, Eric, can you put put a note there? I, I need to check and see what powers the second audio panel on on cap planes. We, we'll do. Thank you. Um, and we talked about the fact that the engine airframe is on the essential bus, air data computer, essential bus, AHARS. So a lot of these things are on the essential bus. They're going to survive uh, for quite a, quite a long time, uh, even if you lose uh, the alternator. One interesting thing is the, the magnetometer is actually in the wing. Um, it's to keep it away from magnetic interference. Um, we have, let's see. That's, those are pretty much the main ones I wanted to talk about. But it's, this is a nice diagram. This is also out of the POH or it might have been out of G1000 training material. I'm not sure which. So I'm going to cover real briefly these failures. I know that I think this was already covered um, in a different uh, section, so I won't spend much time. But if I have a PFD failure, uh, we have that big red button that can be pushed. Uh, when that happened to me on the check ride, I did not do a good job. When it, as soon as you lose the PFD or l your displays are blank, and not giving you what you need, you've got to go immediately to the standby instruments, which I didn't do very well. Um, but and it could take a while to, to to bring up a reversionary mode, which means all of, all of your information, for example, uh, the attitude indicator and everything will move over to the right hand display. And it's also hard to fly on the right hand display, so it's actually probably good to to play with this um, um, if if you can. Um, play with what that looks like. Um, and uh, let's see, so that's reversionary mode. And as I said, it can take a while. And I think this is more of a recent thing with recent firmware um, or updates to the uh, to the system that it's a little slower now. Uh, AHARS failure, we can see down here, a big red lines through the attitude indicator. Uh, and also the, um, you lose the um, electronic uh, HSI. If you uh, lose the, your mag, mag magnetometer, uh, you're going to get loss of heading, which is this uh, basically you're going to get your uh, your DG great um, with red lines through it. So those are some of the things that you might see happen. Here's some other failures. Uh, air data computer. So that's we talked about. Eric talked about how that that's where we get a lot of the pitot tube, uh, static air. All those things go to the air data computer. Well, if I lose it, um, then basically I don't have airspeed, altitude, vertical speed or outside air temperature. Um, and you can see that that's what that's what your display is going to look like um, on the upper right here. You've got red X's um, in those in those subsystems. Uh, if you have an integrated avionics unit failure, um, you could lose COM1, COM2, NAV1, NAV2, transponder. Again, those are going to have um, red X's through them. And you can see down here is the transponder. 
Uh, final one is if you do lose um, not just one of the sensors or one of the like a pitot tube uh, icing over, if you lose the actual computer, the engine airframe computer, you're going to get red X's through everything on the engine, uh, which would make it challenging. Um, I don't think they, they, they didn't test me on this, um, but I'm glad the new flight clinic is going to cover losing some of these things. Any questions on these failures? These should be reviews, I think, for folks. So if you lose your alternator and you're on the essential bus, I don't have that screen in front of me, do you uh, have a transponder? I don't I don't recall if that's on the essential bus. Um, think no, it's that. on the bus. Yeah. Yep. Trans yeah, it's avionics. Avionics. yeah, here it is. I could share that. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess I am sharing still, sort of, yeah. uh -huh. from current slide. Yeah, transponder is avionics, too. So if you shed load and decide to drop this bus, uh, you're going to lose transponder, which, as I said, VFR, probably not a big deal. Um, IFR um, might be might be an uh, important uh, decision to make. Well, it, it can be, depending on the airspace, if you don't have a transponder. Um, but it makes oh. sense it's, it's not only essential because transport is actually a power hungry instrument. It just keeps talking all the time. Oh, yeah, good point. I mean, I, I guess one more comment is uh, make sure you're proficient with uh, landing without flaps. There are many opportunities in these planes where you don't have flaps. Uh, <laughs> the alternator, the memory, the flap motor. It's very exciting. Yeah, that was my, my first flight in the 206, the, uh, the uh, flap. Um, the, the circuit, uh, the wires got disconnected and we didn't know until they inspected it. And the flaps were down about five degrees. They, they wouldn't go up and they wouldn't go down. So that's what we had. <laughs> well, the the 206 has an extra, it has that, that switch at the back door um, that disables the flaps. And I actually was reading an article a long time ago, somebody, not, this is not CAP, um, they were flying a whole bunch of people and the, their flaps were uh, got disabled, they wouldn't work, and they landed and they had some incidents. What turned out to be the case was that one of the pack passengers was leaning against the door just enough to trigger the switch. Yeah, we Mike briefed us about that, and he was the back passenger, so I, that wasn't the case in, the, in this in this case. They were, there actually was a wire that got disconnected, but um, yeah, that it, that is true. In the 206, it can be a little finicky. Right. No, no, I wasn't I wasn't talking about your case in, in, in particular. I was just saying there's an extra failure mode with flaps in 206. Yeah, that 206 was also excellent to uh, go through what you do when you lose an alternator. We uh, lost the alternator belt twice in a flight. Land it, put a new belt on, or the mechanic put a new belt on, took off, and then Lost it again coming in for uh, into Palo Alto. Yeah, my example was from a flight in the 206 over the Tehatch piece. It was a interesting place to lose an alternator. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for the comments. Any any more questions? Well, uh, well, Marty adjusts his uh, his panel. <laughs> I forgot I was sharing. <laughs> uh, thanks for the panel picture. Appreciate it. <laughs> and of course, uh, I mean, this is a kind of a trick that I use, though, because if you really look at it, it tells the boss. So if you get asked the question of you know, where's the transponder? If you can, you can go look at the circuit breaker and you can see also where it is here, even on the plane without pulling the POH out, you know, you can see it right away, you know, where you should isolate. If you zoom in into that picture, you'll see that all the buses are marked there and you know, what the components there are on it. Yeah, the, the circuit breakers are organized by bus, which is very nice, as you see. Yeah, that's actually a good point. That would be another way to shed load, um, I guess, initially, um, if you did, wanted to pick pick out things to drop, so you could maybe leave. Right. Just yeah. The, so you were you were saying, yeah. for example, you don't know 
if you want to just take out the bus too, right? Because for whatever reason, you can just pull all those circuit breakers, right? Assuming you don't need any of them, right? And yeah. that's another way to isolate. Yeah. Although I don't think you can pull these. There's, there's. I think the only one you can pull is the alternator field. Yeah, the autopilot. Yeah, and the alternator. Yeah. Oh, well, that's right. Well, actually, the autopilot too, or the, or the one of those ones also has a ring around it, a collar. Correct. Yeah, the yeah. autopilot. You can also see on that graphics there, all the way at the bottom right. That's the autopilot. There is no way you can pull them, at, pull them, Eric, at all. I thought you could still get behind it and pull it. I don't think so. I think they pop only. They pop they and, only pop? and push okay. in. Yeah, they yeah. pop and you can reset them. Yeah, I think autopilot's the exception. It's got a collar. I think uh, everything else, um, I think you're right. You can't pull.